All right, we, we are live with Tatiana. Tatiana, how are you? Really great. It's nice to see you, albeit not in person this time, but across the world. Uh, someday, well, someday. The world. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> where whereabouts are you? Or not, not specifically, generally speaking. Why can't I tell you specifically? I don't know, because it's like a security thing for Bitcoiners. No one's like, what? I'm not going to tell you where I am. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Of I course. feel like that's only when you're traveling, but when you're home, you're allowed to say, I'm home. Are you? Oh, I try not to always really? keep that a little bit obfuscated. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but where, where about are you? I'm living on the edge. Uh, I'm over in Jersey, so uh, right outside New York. But, you cool. know, uh, I'm doing some traveling soon. I have an event, uh, ARA.global, if people are interested in Texas. Uh, so that'll be really fun because it'll be in person and it's sort of, it's got a little bit of a Burning Man vibe and a lot of OGs are going to be there. And then I'm going to Miami. So yeah, there's cool. a lot of good, good trips coming up. Cool. Okay. So uh, that sounds exciting. I was going to say is uh, um, let's maybe start with where we first met. Um, do you even remember? Cause I'm trying to remember. Uh, I know I'd probably heard of you long before I probably met you. Cause you were like, you're, you've been doing, you know, things in the Bitcoin space for quite some time. And so, but I'm trying to remember the first time we actually met. Oh, I think I remember. Could it have oh, wow. been Ron Paul? Like at, Maybe. were you, did, did you not, uh, did you not perform at, uh, in like uh, some fancy place, uh, some at some place in Mexico, I think it was? Oh yeah, but I think that was, uh, I, I performed for Ron Paul for um, Satoshi Roundtable. That's where it was. Maybe. Yeah. I think that's where maybe I saw you in person. No, no, we met each other before that because I was yeah. in Toronto for Anthony Diorio's conference in April of 2014. And I think that the conference that you're thinking of was in 2016. I think we knew each other before. Uh, oh, wow. I was definitely conference. at that conference. Yeah. So that, that was way, way back. Uh, okay, cool. So, so, um, as I was mentioning earlier, right? So I kind of see Bitcoin as a bit of a singularity event. It's like this thing that, you know, uh, for most people or for many people, it, it's like a, a thing that once they learn about it, it tends to have an impact on their life um, in, in such a way that it changes maybe the arc of it. So I'm really curious to know kind of what your, you know, backstory was like kind of where, yeah, what was your lens coming into Bitcoin and what was it about Bitcoin that, you know, initially intrigued you, but again, before Bitcoin, like where does, where does your story begin? Um, Jersey? Yes, New Jersey. Uh, nice. what, a, what a great part of the story. Uh, so my, uh, my mom, she was from Poland and um, my father was a singer, but my mom had better taste in music. So she would play a lot of 60s and 70s singer songwriters. And so um, I was really lucky she used to take me and my brother skiing, uh, even though she was a single mom because they divorced when I was 13. And yet she still always made time and took us skiing. And she would always play a lot of the music of the 60s and 70s songwriters. And specifically, I liked the idea of using music with a message. And I remember hearing Cat Stevens and thinking, uh, you know, during Peace Train, like, wow, you can fully change the course of history in certain ways. You know, you can really influence people beyond just making them feel something, but you can actually motivate them to feel something bigger than just, you know, love. Even though love is probably the best of them all. Um, so I read a lot of different dystopian novels growing up, you know, 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451. I scared the hell out of myself with that kind of stuff. And I was always really motivated to combine, you know, my passion to help people and with my music. Um, I went to Berklee College of Music in Boston. And around the time that I um, was there, I started delving into jazz music and uh, a lot of Stevie Wonder and a lot of Nina Simone, Jeff Buckley, uh, not that that's jazz, but uh, I kind of got a little bit into some different things, um, but I didn't really start writing my own songs until after I finished school. Uh, I started managing a number of different major recording studios in Manhattan. Um, well, not managing the first one, but since then the others I was, and that was really cool because I was a young kid kid. Uh, um, and I was, you know, in, in a pretty good position at the studios, but I was really disheartened with what was going on. You know, it was the post Britney era, which I consider Britney Spears to be the death of music. I know that she has a lot of fans, but um, if you're a real artist, she sort of ruined the game um, because she basically played to 
the most base instincts of people. You know, her first song was, you know, hit me baby one more time. And she was parading around as an underage, uh, you know, school girl, like a porno. And so that wasn't really, for me, I thought that was really gross. Not that I have a problem with people being sexual, but like, that's just unnecessary. And it kind of lowers the bar or whatever for a lot of other female artists, all of a sudden you feel pressured and you're like, do I have to get a snake and dance around with it? Um, so, uh, you know, I was a little disheartened. Also in the music industry, I was working in a lot of recording studios that did a lot of hip hop music. And I really loved the hip hop of the eighties and early nineties. But when it started to get like a more negative message that really, really bothered me because I thought it had a really bad detriment to society. And unfortunately, these artists that I didn't respect seem to be getting all of the funding and it made me cry at my desk a lot. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit overly sensitive, but I felt this great sense of loss for mankind and I didn't feel a big sense of purpose. I was doing a lot of different gigs in New York, um, you know, just by myself. Um, because I found out that other musicians are not that easy to count on and plus music doesn't pay the bills. So, you know, what am I going to say to them? Oh, like I, I can't just buy them beers every time uh, out of my own pocket. Cause I mean, a lot of those gigs were unpaid. That's the way that it is in New York. Um, and so I was really lucky though, in um, 2012 or rather 2011, because I had been, you know, somewhat interested in politics and stuff. But in 2011, my friend came over and he showed me the movie, The Money Masters by Bill Still. And then I also saw Aaron Russo's classic, America, Freedom to Fascism, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's a great movie. Um, and I was really interested in the Federal Reserve. I was like, okay, these are my enemies, right? <laughs> and so I had a really much better insight into how these powers kind of control us. And I still remember dressing up like a princess, you know, because the people in Zuccotti Park, this was when people were doing Occupy Wall Street, uh, the people in Zuccotti Park look, look, no offense to them, but they look like degenerates. So I went down there the first time I was like, okay, okay, I can red pill these people. And then I went down there, like dressed all up and I had all these uh, DVD copies of Fiat Empire and Freedom to Fascism. And I was just handing them out, like, like the same way that I would do, you know, because I used to do promo stuff. I like, you know, beer promos or something. So, you know, I'd be like, hi, you want a CD? You want a DVD? And, and so I was just red filling people left and right. Um, I started to go to Ron Paul events leading up to his run. And I was super lucky um, to get involved with the community. I started singing at events around the country with thousands of people. I was immediately enveloped by that community. They were very kind to me. And it was a really great time in American history because um, while we were still fighting the powers that be, the vibe among the troops, so to speak, was amazing. You know, you had people from the left, people from the right. It was literally the love illusion. Um, but it was extremely frustrating to see how much media censorship there was. You know, people now talk about, oh, fake news. Listen, honey, fake news is around for a long time before Donald Trump started spouting off about that. Um, because, you know, we would have thousands of people show up for an event and the news would report, if they reported at all, that a couple hundred people came uh, and they really, you know, misrepresented our, our movement and they neutralized our movement. You know, Ron Paul um, was robbed of many, many delegates. The RNC changed their own rules constantly, which now we see that a lot with the DNC, you know, um, with both of the past two presidential elections, the DNC is basically cheating. Um, so that was really, you know, for me, almost like a, a in my in my heart, a death of America, because I remember being down in Tampa during the RNC, and 400 delegates walked out in protest, and um, I think there's only like 1,200 of them, so it was a really large portion. And there was no media coverage. And then Ron Paul just went home dejected. And it was just such a romantic but sad um, time. And around that time, Tony Gallippi and Stephen Pear from BitPay, they sponsored one of my shows, the one down in Tampa, actually, like a big Ron Paul rally. And um, I was, you know, uh, not that familiar with Bitcoin. Obviously, maybe I'd heard about it here and there. But they came to New York after that point and they um, asked me, you know, for a meeting. Of course, I'm going to give them one. And so they told me all about it. And I bought some Bitcoins at $11. Uh, and I wish that I never sold them because <laughs> um, that would be a hell of an ROI. But, you know, I didn't really understand crypto. 
But after a while, it became clear to me that this was the solution to my malaise about the political system because politics is never going to change. So it's going to be some, you know, sociopath trying to take power from the next sociopath next to a psychopath. Um, but with Bitcoin, we actually had the power and that was extremely exciting for me. Um, so I ended up writing a Bitcoin jingle because, you know, even though I knew about the Federal Reserve, I couldn't tell why I should like Bitcoin. So I figured, all right, we need to spice this up a little bit. <laughs> um, and I met Rodolfo Andregas from the La Bitconf, and I think this was their very first one. So in uh, December of uh, 2013, I debuted the Bitcoin jingle along with uh, my song Masters of War, well, my cover of Masters of War, it's a classic Bob Dylan song. And I was really well received in the Bitcoin community. So that was incredible. I got to sing for a lot of people and make a lot of amazing friends. and. In 2014, that's when I created uh, Tatiana Coin. So I think you know about Tatiana Coin a little bit, right? I definitely heard about Tatiana Coin. Yep. Cool. So I'll, I'll tell your audience if they're like, "What the heck is this Tatiana?" Coin? Sure. Why not? Uh, so I know everybody's really into NFTs and you know all this stuff right now, but before there were NFTs, there was Tatiana Coin. Um, we originated and pioneered the idea. Um, and executed it in, as the first uh, artist cryptocurrency in the world. So we built it on top of Counterparty. I worked with Adam B. Levine. And what we were trying to solve was two main problems, fans and funding. So artists need to eat and they need to make sure that somebody's actually going to listen to them. But what was really frustrating for me as an independent artist with you know no money uh, was that you know I would... Uh, basically sign up for, uh, you know, some kind of a social media site. But as I went from site to site, you know, because they come out of Vogue and the next one is more popular, I realized that I was actually building up my audience for that platform. But by the time you get to Facebook, you realize that you don't actually own your audience. You don't have access to them if they, you know, censor you. They charge you money in order to reach your audience. And that was extremely frustrating. I felt like it was pretty... Um, you know, not, not what I was kind of offered at the beginning or my impression of what it was. Um, so uh, on the other side, you know, there's the fundraising part. So you had this advent of Indiegogo and Kickstarter campaigns, uh, you know, Amanda Palmer was really famous for raising a lot of money. But the problem with those Kickstarter campaigns is that, you know, they donate a t-shirt and that's pretty much the end of the relationship. So um, because cryptocurrency is decentralized and you can be connected directly to your fans like why not use that mechanism in order to do that so when people would buy a tatiana coin it was uh used to raise money for my third album called keep the faith and um you know as they were donating for the album they would this time get back tatiana coins which would allow them you know discounts at my store um you know private chats with me um, and just a number of other kinds of perks, a little bit like a Patreon. Um, and so it would also give me that access to them, solving that fan problem. And it would allow me to build my own tribe without necessarily having to be dependent on someone else. Um, it was extremely hard. And I definitely cried a lot during that process because I had no idea that tech stuff takes 5,000 years and that when they tell you it's going to be ready next week, week that means it's going to be ready in three weeks, if you're lucky. Uh, no, they, they never say next week. They'll say it's, it'll be done in two yeah, weeks. Yeah, two weeks, my ass. Because that's just enough time for you to forget. Uh, well, I never <laughs> and then And then in two weeks, they'll be like, it'll be, it'll be just another two weeks. <laughs> no, no, the eternal two yeah. weeks. But yeah, okay, carry on. So Tatiana Coin, what year are we in so now? So this is like, April when, when of 2014. This... Okay, and and so okay, so wait, hold on. Is this ERC twenty? No, nope. right? Doesn't even exist. Yet. How did you make it then? Counterparty, right? So which was on top of the Bitcoin protocol. Now, I guess a lot of people don't even maybe know that that's possible, right? Because nowadays everything's an ERC twenty token, but but it is, right? You can you can build a coin on top of Bitcoin. Yes, absolutely. And so what? How? So what did that journey look like? So you, you said it was it made you cry, but I mean, were there some ups in there as well, or mostly? Well, downs? there's always ups in crypto. <laughs> Come on, I mean, it's such an amazing right? journey to be able to bond and feel so inspired by amazing people. So yeah, I mean, whatever. I was crybabying, but um, you know, we we birthed that little puppy. Uh, but after we had, after we, we launched and we raised enough money uh, to fund my album, the coin itself was, 
it needed like, you know, it was like you have a car and you don't have any roads, right? You needed to have the infrastructure and the interface in order to actually interact with coin. Um, and so we tried working on that. And then Adam Levine from Let's Talk Bitcoin, he started a company called Tokenly. And so Tokenly started building out um, different kinds of tools that we could use. And that's been in the works. Now we have a really cool music blockchain platform. I'm happy to tell you about that. But in the interest of the story, uh, let's move it along. So um, I, I collected that money. And then during that time, I became friends with Lynn Albrecht. So some of your listeners, most people are pretty familiar with the Silk Road story by now. And, you know, when I first heard about the Silk Road, I thought, well, I don't know, this guy's making a drug website. Like, what do you think was going to happen? But the story is a little bit more complicated than that. It was a story of liberty. It was a story of how Bitcoin found its legs, right? Because if we didn't have the Silk Road, we may not have seen such adoption. Uh, and also the Silk Road was a cultural center. People were exchanging ideas. And um, he was persecuted very heavily by the United States government, specifically Chuck Schumer. And I always found it curious that Chuck Schumer was the head of the banking committee. Maybe he could see that Bitcoin was the real threat. And so they wrapped it up in the, oh, we care about the drugs, except for the pharmaceutical ones, we're cool with that. Uh, and then we care about the drugs, we're so afraid. And so then they basically railroaded him. I mean, his trial was a travesty. Um, there was so much corruption after he was already in jail even though they said he was the only Dread Pirate Roberts, you know, they, um, somebody was logging in as DPR. So it was basically, you know, horrible. And the judge, she punished him based on his political views. Um, I was given some insight into this story because of Lynn Albrecht. I was doing interviews for the Tatiana show, my podcast, I've had it forever. And um, I was very moved, especially, you know, by a mother's love. And I got to be good friends with Ross. I would go and visit him in the prison. I went probably a dozen times. I think I was, I know I was the first person from the community that was welcome. So I was really appreciative of that opportunity. But at the same time, I mean, it's obviously really, really depressing. Um, and I think it gave me a certain sense of purpose. So when I put out the third album, Keep the Faith, the one that I funded all with crypto, what I did was on the album cover, because I had written a Silk Road song, you know, sensitive, sad ballad. And um, Ross had given me a drawing of me for my birthday. Um, and I used the drawing that he made in prison and I used it on the album cover because I felt like number one, it brought attention to Ross, which I certainly wanted to do. But it also illustrated the importance of artist independence. You know, if you're an artist, you need to be able to, um, to express yourself freely. And a lot of times because of the music industry and because of other considerations, you don't necessarily get to do that. Like if I had a record label, are they gonna let me have some political prisoner or drug kingpin, however you wanna put it, on the album? I mean, maybe not. And that's a real problem if you're a person that believes that art is um, important in terms of you know, global change and culture. Um, so yeah, that, that was, uh, that was definitely a really cool experience since then Adam made the, made the platform. And so we're working on that pretty diligently for a while now. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've just been doing a lot of stuff in crypto ever since, uh, I got involved in my, I have a company called crypto media hub and we do marketing and PR in the space. So that's since 2015. Um, I was working on the Tatiana show podcast. And, uh, and then a couple of years ago, I started doing proof of love, which is, you know, after, after you're in crypto for a while, you get a little bit burnt out and you don't really want to hear about Bitcoin all the time. And I felt like a lot of people in this space were maybe not very emotionally intelligent, uh, myself included, you know, I certainly needed some improvement. So I started proof of love because I wanted to give people an opportunity to explore other aspects of themselves. Like I get it. We all love crypto, but you know, when your wife leaves you because all you care about is crypto, you're going to be crying and you're not going to be a good CEO. So I figured maybe I could bridge the gap because a lot of times wives are pissed off at their husbands for being in this. So, you know, I felt like it was a good crossover show. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've just been keeping super busy with a lot of different things. I, I feel like maybe I'm running out of them, but I, I think I'm forgetting a few at the same time. Hey, did you, did you, um, I, th I thought we connected around Christmas time. Weren't you going to do something? Um, did you end up doing, I thought you were going to do an event or something. Yes. Did you end up doing it? Yes. How so, was it? Okay. So <clears throat> what happened was, is that, I guess, what was that? 
going into this year at the beginning of 2020, I, my mom has a house in the Bahamas. And when I spent some time in the Bahamas, I really felt like the people there, just like in most places could really benefit from cryptocurrency. And I figured, you know, we're always doing stuff for ourselves, but I have an event called crypto care. So it's crypto dash cares. Um, and basically it was the objective is to go down to the Bahamas and do a bunch of do gooder stuff. So educate people about Bitcoin, clean up a beach, you know, help some kids learn, uh, learn some new coding stuff, uh, give them some computers, all this different stuff. And it was a pretty, pretty big idea, but I didn't leave that much time for it. So my plan was to do a mini event, almost scope out the scene. Uh, in January of this year, and then come back into April and May, and then do the event. Obviously, April and May was uh, so, um, but in January, I was very lucky. I went with some very good friends, um, and I brought my engineer slash producer slash music partner um, down with me, and so we worked a little bit on the fourth album, which I'm looking to release, Um, but otherwise, yeah, we put on a local event. I played, uh, we had a big, big show. It was super fun. Um, it was pretty well received, definitely, you know, learned some things about next time, but we did that smaller scale version. And maybe if the world ever opens up, I'd love to do another one. Cause I love that area. And, um, you know, the Caribbean is not the worst place to be in the winter. So have you ever, have you ever studied, um, like the history of music or anything? I mean, I, I'm not gonna, I, like I have it, but I'm just curious. Like, do you like, do you know like how far music goes back? I think music Like it just seems ancient. something like it's, yeah, it just seems like it's probably been with humans forever, no? Like just, you can see people sitting around separated. fires. Yeah, no, I mean, but we've what, had music but what is it though? since the beginning of time. But what is it about music though that, that resonates, you know, pun intended, um, in the sense that, you know, every culture, every, like, religion, every corner of the world, every, um, every language seems to somehow gravitate towards, you know, music, right? So I'm just curious, like, have you ever looked into that? Like, why? I wonder why? Is it just that, like, humans just do for some random reason? Because, because even if you look on, like, forget tribes, think about today, like, you go on YouTube, what are the most popular videos? It's always, you know, like, music, right? So, it's, it's such a, such an important part of, um, um, like, you, you mentioned Britney Spears earlier, uh, was it Baby, Baby Hit Me One More Time, right? Uh, I, I came across, I came across that recently, um, reading about this guy named Max Martin, Did I tell you about this guy? No, tell me. Like, so I, I've been just kind of like, I, I have a fascination with, I know this is more about like Bitcoin and all that, but I'm, I'm so curious and, and so intrigued by music as well. But there's this guy named Max Martin, who's essentially, he's the guy who wrote Baby Hit Me One More Time. He's the guy that wrote, remember, remember uh, Backstreet Boy, uh, remember NSYNC? Remember? Unfortunately, I do. Yes, yes, yes. So he was like the genius, I guess, behind some of that. And like, and, and like, to this day, people um, like famous, really, really famous singers. He's like the, the, like, I think even the weekend he even produces for him. And, and I think he's got like more like hits than like anyone else in the world. Um, and so I sometimes wonder, like, you know, like, what is it? Like, what is it about music that's so, and, 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 and then within the Bitcoin space, like music um, hasn't really proliferated, right? Like it doesn't seem like there's been a few songs here and there, but there haven't been like more artists kind of entering the space or singing about it. And you'd think that once that happens at scale, like people would actually start to think about Bitcoin other than some geeky, weird, um, you know, kind of side project thing. Um, right. but, but anyway, so, but what's, okay, so I, okay, so let me just break it down. So I have a couple of questions. So what is well, the I music? Well, I wanted to, I wanted yeah, yeah, go, to go, go, please. Your, your point, yeah. because you say yeah. that there's not that many people singing about Bitcoin. So I get a lot of random people being like, oh, you should write a song about Litecoin, you should write a song about Dogecoin. <laughs> like, this is stupid. Sorry, guys, but like, yeah. if you're a real artist, you're not, sorry, I'm adjusting my lighting a little bit. <laughs> Um, but if you're a real artist, like you're not just sitting around thinking about cryptocurrency and about how much you want to write a song. The reason why people write a song about Bitcoin with the exception of me and like a handful of other people is because they want people to donate to them and give them money. It's like doing a parody song or like a joke song. Mm. It's not something that has a lot of artistic integrity. Maybe if you throw like the word Bitcoin into some raps, 
but like how many freaking Bitcoin songs are you going to write? To me, mm. the, the idealism behind Bitcoin is what really drove the Bitcoin jingle. I mean, it's a jingle. It's supposed to be catchy. But if you listen to the lyrics, they're very subversive and that's on purpose. So I think that, you know, it becomes like a kitschy thing. And if you're a really real artist, you're not going to want to um, to just write those kinds of things. And then secondarily, artists are not financially literate. They're usually really, really hard left. Um, there's this weird uniformity to the political views of um, of artists around the world. And one might call that cultural Marxism on, uh, by design. But, you know, Bitcoin is about freedom and liberty. And while I think that those values live in the hearts of every artist by nature, they're not necessarily exposed to that um, anywhere in culture. I mean, I had to watch a bunch of weird videos on YouTube in order to get into um, into into Ron Paul and like learn about Austrian economics. And it's always been a little source of frustration for me because I wish that artists who I do believe are um, a majority of artists have a have a good feeling toward the world. They want to make it better. Maybe that's not their main focus, but they do. I think if they had a better understanding of how things work, um, I think that they would be able to identify the problems a little bit more acutely and then they can um, rally and represent um, better values in their music. Uh, I would love to see more artists advocating for Bitcoin because, you know, when you sing a song on stage, you have everybody, everybody loves you, right? As long as you're not, you know, bad. But you have this very unique and very special ability to touch people in their hearts. You cut through language, you cut through color, you cut through religion, you cut through sexual orientation. None of that is important. Music really brings people together. And that's why I think that there's been a concentrated effort by the music industry specifically to subvert music with any meaning. You know, you don't hear a single anti-war song and we've been at war for a solid 20 years in the United States. And that is not an accident. They want people to listen to something like Rihanna or the WAP song or Britney dancing around like a hooker. And they want them to only think at their lowest level. I mean, it, a dumbed down populace is how you control them. If you have somebody like John Lennon running around, like trying to inspire some kind of other types of uh, outlooks and saying anti-war stuff, I mean, that is a real effing problem for the state. They can't have that. Why would they want people to feel free? Um, a friend of mine recently was saying, you know, it's so weird. We haven't had any concerts in a while. And I was like, yeah, whatever, uh, politics. And then I thought about it a little bit. And I thought, you know, that's a very interesting point because when you have live music, you don't know if the person next to you voted for Biden or Trump. Like, you don't care about that at all. You don't care about 90% mm -hmm. of the stuff that we're supposed to care about with identity politics and all the other nonsense that they're shoving down our throats while we're trapped in our houses. You know, we are actually much more similar than we are different, but people can't tap into that right now. So I've been very ideologically driven and, and I've taken a lot of time to try and evangelize to a lot of different artists about this. But the problem is, is that there isn't such a huge payout. Like people say, oh, you like, how can artists get involved in Bitcoin? And like, I don't know. I mean, realistically, most of the, uh, you know, what the best thing artists can do is freaking buy Bitcoin. That's it. Because like, okay, maybe you can get some tips, but that's not going to motivate artists. Um, so it, it can be a little bit challenging to bring that motivation in there. But if anybody's going to be the messenger besides me, I think it should be other artists too. Uh, because I think that we we do have a lot of power there. Yeah, okay, I was going to ask you about Ron Paul. So Do Dr. Ron Paul, I, I, so I'm, I'm a bit of a fanboy as well. I've been to one of his rallies, and I, I also got to got to meet him in person just for like a few brief seconds. Um, I'm curious, have you have you ever talked to him? Yes. Oh, have you, many times. Did, have you ever had? Okay, then I have to ask you a second question. Have you ever had a chance to ask him how he discovered Bitcoin? Like, like, what was his, like, because yeah, I'm always curious, because I, I learned about him, and I told him when I met him this, I learned about him before Bitcoin, obviously, because his whole movement thing, right? Um, but it was, it was, it was because of his education, I felt like I was ready to take Bitcoin in. Yet, I think I'm pretty sure, and he, when I met him, he's like, I wish I had seen it earlier, because <laughs> it took him a few years, right? And, and maybe Peter Schiff is going to have a similar moment. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> I think Peter Schiff is trolling us. That's that's the conclusion, and he wants everybody to send in Bitcoin to prove it, and I think that's his shtick, but 
Regarding Ron Paul, no, I've never really asked him that. Like, I got to open for him at several different events. And actually, at that Satoshi Roundtable event that you were talking about, I, I got um, to sing on stage. And then I had dinner with him and Carol, his wife. And it was jealous. so I'm cool. jealous. <laughs> yeah, you should be. It was, it was uh, one of my happiest moments. I mean, the first time I met Dr. Paul, I think I actually... Like, like had tears, you know, like a girl meeting a beetle and it's just like this old guy. Um, but I love Ron Paul. Um, you know, everybody is flawed, but uh, he's done quite a lot to um, change and inspire uh, millions of people, not just in the United States, because the ideas of liberty and freedom, while they are really somewhat fostered in the United States with variants these days, uh, those are things that really everybody is American in their hearts, if that's what it, being American means. Um, and I just, I learned so much from him and um, the community around him has, you know, been been really supportive and really inspiring because you know, you're watching everything fall apart. But between Bitcoin and that community, I feel a sense of maybe not control, control is a little bit overstated, but just like I'm doing something, you know? And after the 2012 election, there was definitely a period of time where I was down in the slumps. So I was like, oh, you know? Um, so thank God for Bitcoin, because I think that really took um, took Ron Paul and, and those that came before him and put those ideas into something that could actually take action. I mean, people are all complaining about the elections. Like these elections are a freaking charade. You know, what's really important is what you do in your time, how you treat your family, how you treat yourself. Um, and, um, you know, Bitcoin gives me, uh, I mean, this sounds a little bit overstated, but like a reason to live, you know, because it, it gives me that satisfaction that there's, uh, that there's still hope. Mm. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I pick it up what you're putting down. I, um, yeah, yeah, Dr. Ron Paul, a lot of respect for his work. I, I and, and then you mentioned Occupy Wall Street as well. In fact, my first brush with the whole idea of like the Ron Paul movement was when I was watching a Occupy Wall Street thing on YouTube and there was like a Ron Paul guy there telling everybody about, you know, like the other side of it. And and so yeah, I think I think I think I don't know, it seems like a lot of bitcoiners have a very similar kind of thread on, on many on many sides. Um, yeah, so so I guess moving on, um, in terms of like, you know, the contrarian question I asked you about like Bitcoin, or I guess maybe I don't think I've even asked you yet, have I? Nope. Is there a belief that you have that you hold that you think most other Bitcoiners, you know, may disagree with you on or I don't know? So yeah, I, you, you given me a little preview of this question earlier and I was like, yeah. I don't know, but actually there is something because, you know, I came in from the mindset of Liberty and while I'm very happy to be welcoming toward other people, it's a little bit like when Californians move to Texas and they bring their politics with them. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, to me, the great thing about Bitcoin is I could be as, as free as I want to be, you know, I'm libertarian anarchist type of person and, I don't have to hide that. And those ideals are found among a lot of us. But after a while, because Bitcoin kept going more mainstream, there's been a lot of, um, you know, hardcore leftist kind of infiltrations and people that don't really understand a lot of the underlying, um, I guess, motivations for why we Bitcoin. And I feel like that really corrupts the space. It starts to become a safe space. Like I love women in Bitcoin, of course, I'm a huge fan of women. I'm very welcoming to them. I work with women all the time, but um, there's these women's groups and then it starts becoming about identity politics. And I'm so irritated because I don't want to be valued uh, or felt bad for because I have female parts, you know, like I just want to be equal. I want to look at people as individuals. And I feel like that collectivism is very dangerous. So, you know, I try and be respectful of people's views and, you know, I'm not trying to argue with them necessarily, but at the same time, I feel like that stuff can be very dangerous and it sort of hijacks the movement. Um, and, and now all of a sudden I have to go into the closet, you know, I, um, I'm interviewing for jobs and then sometimes I'll post something on Twitter. I'm like, well, maybe I won't get that job now uh, because a lot more people are, are just not my, not my background, but I can't really change who I am. 
Um, I don't want to. I think that it's important more than ever, as especially as an artist. Like, I have businesses, and those you know function and whatnot. But the core of my purpose on earth is not to have a marketing company. It's to sing, and it's to inspire people. It's to move them. And it would be disingenuous to my own values to all of a sudden turn coat and and comply because I think that sometimes that collectivism can be very dangerous. You know, I mentioned earlier that my mom was uh, born in Warsaw and then grew up there. And I remember when I was really little, I was like maybe six or seven. I remember it very well. I went into the living room and I said, mom, you know, I was thinking about it. Why don't people just put all their money into a pile and then they can take out what they need. And, you know, that's a great idea. And she's like, no, Tanya, that's communism and it doesn't work. And she's right. You know, I mean, historically communism has been a, a horrific failure around the world. And so when I hear some of these ideas, they're not typical left. You know, the left used to be about anti-banksters, anti-war, uh, freedom of speech, all of these really, you know, agreeable values. That's why people at the Ron Paul rallies were from the left and from the right. They were finding a common ground. But now, probably because of the media, but things have gone like full on commie. And so with my understanding of history, I'm not really a big fan. So I would say that that would be, you know, maybe not everybody in the cryptocurrency community agrees with me. And I'm certainly not looking to insult anybody with different political views, but I do think that they can be quite dangerous. And um, not that I need a safe space, but this was my safe space to actually be free to express myself. And for a po portion of the population to essentially say that, you know, they're so tolerant. I don't see a lot of tolerance for my ideas. I mean, look at the music industry. The music industry is furious if you step outside of that really hardcore, you know, AOC style um, left leftism. And why? Music is supposed to be free and you're supposed to be able to express a lot of different views. And, and I'm very frustrated by that stifling of civilized conversation and respect for others. Um, so I hope that there's a little bit, I mean, I don't know really what could be done to change that other, you know, really, but um, the world is kind of evolving constantly. And hopefully we might find a middle ground that's a little bit less polarized like it is right now, especially in the States. Yeah, no, I'm, I remember too, like when back when I used to think about all that stuff, you know, like left and right and red and blue and all these like colors and, it always felt like so defeating, right? Cause I got like, you'd be like, oh, well, I, I'm not even American. So like, why would I even invest like my time into thinking about this stuff? But you're always like, whether it's in your own country or whatever, it's always like, oh, like only if this person gets in, then all of my life's problems will be solved. And it's like, um, no, you know, and, 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 and the fact that Ron Paul brought to light, you know, that, that it was like our money system that, you know, was, was at fault. And, and come, out comes Satoshi, fixes all of our life's problems. So, okay, so a couple of things. So I have, I was gonna ask you a question. Do you, th do you think much about AI at all? Have you thought about it? <laughs> it's probably like a weird it. question, huh? No, I mean, I somewhat think about it. Where are you going with this? I mean, you know, I, I think about it sometimes. Have I you ever heard of this idea called the story. singularity? Well, no, I mean, I some have, people but... some people argue that, that, that the emergence of the singularity will create a world of artists that we will have no option but to create art because everything that like whether you're a driver or a coder or a doctor all of it can be programmed away but you know what I mean and, and, and by the way they can write music too it's just nobody would probably want to listen to it but my point is is like maybe that is the end game for everyone right to to, to like express art to some extent um because like robots are coming no <laughs> You know what? I'm a little bit afraid of the robots coming. I'm not really thrilled about it. I think that um, I don't really think of it in the context of art. Although I will say something: when you're well fed, your art isn't as good. You know, really, you need you need mm. to suffer. You need to s strive for things. Um, I've heard about different studies, and you know, people people need um, they need to work. They need to have like goals and you know suffer to get there right like there has to be at least a little bit of that in life you can't just be like sitting around eating bonbons all day uh you're just not going to be as happy um so i don't know what's going to happen with all that stuff like when i think of ai and then i think of robots i think of those 
um, evil dog looking things that are basically monitoring everybody around and saying like, wear your mask, don't be bad, do what we say. I mean, you know, uh, there's like almost like a RoboCop future and I'm not really excited about that because I think that the human being has such a, such a sense of nuance and there's such a high intelligence there. I mean, even though we can all be idiots sometimes, <laughs> um, there's, there's definitely something irreplaceable about the human spirit and the human soul so I don't know. I mean, I want to live longer. I am doing this really super long fast right now and I'm down with that. And I'm not saying there shouldn't be some improvements, but at the end of the day, like I like well, well, pa pa the part of part, part of this whole singularity thing is that that people would uh, people will rather not only stop the aging process, but reverse it in the next like 20 to 30 years. So All right, I'll do that. I'm willing to do You that. in for that part? All right. And Obviously. by the way, I wasn't talking about robo dogs that spy on us. I'm talking about like a robo dog that protects you. Imagine like 12 robo dogs. That's how they sell guarding. it to you. They no, tell you it's going to protect you. Yeah. It's open source. It's no. open source. You can read Those the code. dogs are going down. I'm going to kick them <laughs> if I see them. <laughs> kick it in the face. Yeah, no, right totally. On. Like I literally will. Like those dogs are. No, I spent I spent ten years in robotics or eight years in robotics before I got into Bitcoin. Um, and so, I I I I think just think people have been watching way too much Terminator too. Dude, have you gone outside? Every single person <laughs> outside. Even though, look, I get some people like masks. I'm not really. I see no evidence for them. In fact, I see detrimental evidence. But that's aside, right? Okay, people want to wear masks. They think it's going to keep them safe. The entire country, well, actually, all of New York City is wearing masks outside with no one around. The whole city is like completely dead. And you've got like one lone guy with a mask. Then he pulls it down. He smokes a cigarette. Then he touches it. I mean, it's completely idiotic. And also, where do you think this virus is? Like, does nobody understand the concept of fresh air? So I don't know. I'm a little I, bit I, I do about find that things. a bit funny. No, no, no. I, I read a study a long, like a while ago that was like, that, that like back when the big pandemic hit, like the last time, you know, in what was it? 20 something, 19 something, 20 something. Um, they actually took care of patients outside and the ones that were taken care of outside fared far better. And like the doctors and the nurses and all of them just because of two things, because of fresh air and sunlight. Boom. That's the <laughs> ticket. Why wasn't sunlight encouraged? I mean, think about this. We've been locked down two weeks to slow the spread. Yeah, whatever. And we've been locked down for nine months now. And barely anybody ever says something like, I don't know, get some exercise, go outside, uh, take some supplements, uh, you know, have some bone broth. None of this stuff is, is ever encouraged. And, you know, you see much higher rates of suicide. But if you look at the statistics, People who um, get really sick from COVID and die, majority of them are uh, vitamin D deficient. In fact, over 70% of the United States is vitamin D deficient from what I've read. So, you know, why aren't we talking about that? Um, I would like to see a focus, and I've certainly been putting a lot of focus this year into personal development. I mean, what else am I going to do in my apartment, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I've been putting a lot of effort into personal development and exploration, you know, digging up some demons, which is never fun, but, you know, somewhat rewarding and, you know, trying to be healthy. You know, look, everybody's got, um, you know, things where they're not the most perfectly healthy. And I'm definitely that, right. You know, I ate like 4,000 packages of gummy bears last week, but <laughs> and this week, but this week I'm fasting. 4,000 packs of gummy bears? Maybe not 4,000, but at least 40. It was really You bad. like the gummy bears, don't you? I know, I know. I well, had a pack friend, last week. I, I love gummy bears too. So no, no. You know what I like more than gummies? Those little colas. You know, have you ever oh, had I don't those want with a the cola. little- no, no, no. They're like, they're gummy. I know what they, they look are. like, but they're colas. They're like Coke in a little gummy form. Like, thank so you. I, I never drank soda. Like when I was little, all I wanted was milk. I didn't want anything to do with soda. So I hate Coke soda. is my weak spot. Oh, really? Uh, oh, oh, that yeah. stuff I, will I, burn I gotta your drop belly. It. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. So good. So good. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, Okay. What about Ubi? Have you ever thought about universal basic income? Yes. I think it's a what are your, idea. Yes. Tell because me why. Because people need to suffer. Before. People need to suffer. Boom. Make people them suffer. Need okay. to not suffer, but they need to have something to strive for. Um, I've mm. also read, I also have a ton of um, like high-end uh, libertarian type uh, or Austrian economist friends 
and I've interviewed them on uh, my podcast and I've read maybe like 20 articles on UBI. And while I'm not good at, like when I remember things, I'm not always necessarily good at details, although sometimes random ones will pop out. I'm good at overarching ideas. And from what I've read, F UBI, it's not good. It's a really mm. great way to get everybody to be enslaved to the state. And that is the last thing that I want. You know, this is something that if you want people to be dependent on their overlords, give them some UBI. I mean, look at the welfare system. The welfare system incentivized getting um, fathers out of the home, which has been devastating. It's probably the single greatest case for a crappy life is to have a broken home. Um, and basically when you give people that little bit of money, they're like, oh, well, I don't want to work because then I'm going to lose that money. And so you disincentivize any kind of sense of purpose for them. You know, what are they going to do? Sit at home and consume and watch TV and Netflix and stuff like that's not healthy. And mm. in a way, I would say that that's also by design, because why would you want a bunch of healthy, independent thinkers? People say the education system is broken in the United States. I would say the education system works perfectly well. If you think of it in the lens that they do not want thinkers, they do not want to teach civics. They don't want people to understand what their rights are. They don't want people to understand how the monetary system works. They don't want people to understand even how to balance a checkbook. Was the because internet the, one big accident for them? Like they, they probably didn't want someone like the internet out. <laughs> I mean, the, well, right. We're so, talking about them, right? You know, that's like a little yeah, bit of yeah, a yeah. big term. Um, although I believe the internet may have been invented by the by military. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but it's, it's a tool like any other, right? Bitcoin can be used for evil and Bitcoin can be used for good. Any mm. technology has that same thing. You know, you could drive to your grandma's house and bring her a cake or you could run somebody over because you're Or you could angry. drive it into her house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Don't <laughs> so, do the latter. <laughs> yeah, none of that. No, no, no. I know people are stressed out right now. Keep it together, everybody. Um, so, yeah, I yeah, mean, I, like I would a- not... Yeah, it's supposed to be like a healing show. No, I'm kidding. Uh, okay, so this has been pretty fascinating. Um, I have a question for you. So you said you have an album that's about to come out, or you said it's coming out. What's that about? Like, yeah. what's yeah? Can you like share a bit about it, or it's like totally like on the DL? No, no, no. no. I'm totally excited about this. Actually, yeah. so. Um, and actually I'm hoping to get some sponsors in Bitcoin because, you know, I don't have a lot of money and, uh, making an album can be expensive. So, um, this is going to be my fourth full album that I'm self-releasing and, uh, we've got 12 songs. I've got, you know, my revolution song I'm going to be releasing pretty soon. Um, but you know, I, I tentatively have the album titled love songs for idiots, which I don't know if I'll stick with that title, but you know, I've had a lot of broken hearts over the years and, I've taken some time to see, you know, why I'm making these bad choices. And oftentimes, you know, I put my, my feelings of course into my music. And so this was a little bit of a tribute to the heart or the broken heart. And, and also really a lot about self-love, which is a ongoing practice and is not always sustainable, right? Um, everybody has kind of like demons that they struggle with, but self-love, um, it takes a little bit of time to really understand what that means. And I'm not saying that I do, but it's certainly something that I focus on on the record. Um, I had an incredible band uh, we recorded out in Brooklyn. And what we're doing is, is we're kind of doing a video of that recording process and um, just kind of telling a little bit of the story about why artists should be subscribing to cryptocurrency and then doing interviews with other cryptocurrency companies, other artists, um, music industry people, and other creators and basically trying to um, lure people in with, with essentially, yeah, like a story, right? Um, you don't have to educate people with a graph of stuff or, you know, some stupid explanation. So, wait, love like, song, I want to make- Love um, songs for idiots? Yes. Is, is it dedicated for people who love shit coins or? No, no. Is no, it, is it, <laughs> no, kidding, no, no. I kid, love, I kid. That was good. No, love good. songs for idiots. It's like, I've wasted so many love songs on these idiots. You know what I mean? Like these guys didn't mean anything to me. They, well, they meant something to me and, and whatnot, but a lot of them were not really worth the songs that they were written on. And frankly, I'm one of the idiots. Like I'm just, you know, when we, when we came out with proof of love, um, I was, I wanted to make our tagline, you know, like the blind leading the blind, because I don't know, like I don't have a boyfriend. What do I know about that? But I think that that exploration is important and we'll see that might not be the album cover or anything. But. No, I think, it, I think it's a great name because like the, if I've learned anything about like music, it's that it should be about love. Cool. Like love sells. 
Yes. Love, like, love people don't want to sing but... about, people don't want to hear about anything else. Not, they, I, yeah. So the fact that you're singing about love songs and accepting Bitcoin, that's like the optimal, like, you know, end result. Like that, that to me that, I, I mean, I'm banking on it. I think it's going to do well. Thank you. I mean, the album came out really awesome. It's got like an 80s uh, feel to it. There's almost a little a bit of an Avril Lavigne kind of like mm. punky kind of feel to it, which I mean, I wasn't even a fan of Avril Lavigne, but her attitude kind of comes through. And uh, it's do you just start with the melody? Really like when you're coming up with a song, do you start with the melody or do you start elsewhere? Um, OK, so that's that's a cool question. So the way that I usually write a song is uh, I'm bopping along and then all of a sudden like a melodic phrase with lyrics most likely will come to my mind and so I will do a quick voice note because I forget things and um, and so then I'll sit down with my guitar and I will um, kind of figure out what chords I want underneath while I'm working out the melody and the lyrics but I'll use the lyrics like I'll record it because I have you know just videos and videos of myself recording um, and so I'll record the song um, and I'll do like kind of like word shapes. So some of the words I'll stick with, but I try not to be too judgmental about the lyrics because I, I think that it's a communion with the self. You know, I think that um, music is, is the most holy of expressions. Uh, I mean, maybe making love would be, um, would be comparable, but I mean, music is, is the great unifier and the great um, key to your own inside right and that's how it's been for me um it's been my best friend uh so yeah so i'll write it out and then you know i'll go back i'll listen to it i'll type out whatever weird lyrics i wrote and then i kind of polish them up um i'll get it about 85 percent done and then i'll bring it over to will uh my engineer producer whatever um and he's amazing so he'll help me tighten it up and then we're we work so well like we went into the out, we went into the studio and we had the full band, basically 85% of the music done in three days. Um, they were fantastic. And uh, now he's, he's down in Texas. So he's mixing and we're going to put some background vocals, but I don't know if we're going to have it out by Christmas, but that would be nice. Mm. Um, so you, you consider yourself an entrepreneur kind of yeah. sort of yeah right oh, so in that case uh, do you have any advice like some 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 parting wisdom like in terms of if there's others out there that are <clears throat> let's say touched by bitcoin also maybe feel like they have a gift to offer uh in the form of music like you know do you have some suggestions like do they go to your website or do they how do they get like how do they turn it into something real and not just like you know yeah, I don't well, know. Any, any, any like words of wisdom for them? Well, really, like we're fundraising right now for Token.fm. So a lot of artists come to me and they say that they want to get involved. And unfortunately, you know, if we don't have the threshold to offer the support for them, like we can't onboard them until like the funding is there. So that would be my answer in like six months. But um, normally I really tell them to just uh, to buy Bitcoin because the biggest so problem I think a lot of artists face is just money. You don't have money. You know what mm. I mean? And the music industry is, it's, it's so awful because it's like, I don't know, maybe there are other industries like this, but I noticed this. It's like one of these industries where all these other industries, like you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're like this, that. Like if you're good at your job, you get ahead. Whereas there are a million incredible artists around the world that will never get to even, some of them won't ever get to even record anything because it's cost reclusive or because they have to just like, it's not easy to feel um, the ability to just like do a music career and then also have a full-time job. It really burns you out. And I found that first personally, it was really, really hard. And, you know, like, let's say um, the album costs around 25 grand, right? Like if I put out my music, then I have to spend money in order for people to see it. I can't reach my Facebook audience that I already paid to develop. Uh, unless I pay them more money. And then what am I going to do if I, if I get um, my album on to Spotify? Um, if you get a million plays on Spotify, which is difficult as hell, it's not like an easy thing, you get $7,000. And most people have to split that with other people. I mean, think about it. Like the, a million plays, like how are you supposed to look at music as a good ROI? It's horrible. So 
you know, when I was younger, my family was like, oh, you should just do music as a hobby. And I was like, burn Wait, it, hell you, no. Well, I have a question. You know, you, uh, you know, the whole Indiegogo Kickstarter model. I was actually, I, I forgot to ask you this. I was going to ask you, but like, is there a way to marry that model with the crypto model? That's like, what I did. Oh, That's no, exactly. I meant, I meant. No, I meant in the sense that like can, oh, I guess, well, you took Bitcoin and you gave them Tatiana coin, right? And then Tatiana coin became a thing that became, did it have its own price or how did it work? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, it was I mean, trading. It was, no, it was not trading. And a lot of people were trying to get me to pump and dump it. And I don't pump and dump. Like I'm not, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. like to do things straight. Um. So yeah, they were, they, you know, we, we released it. And at first we did this really strange bidding model. Mm -hmm. And nobody understood how to do it. So that was definitely challenging. But the point is, is that I'm making my Tatiana coins out of thin air, essentially, right? As like a counterparty token. And then I'm selling it. And so instead of an Indiegogo campaign where you get like a t-shirt and that's Sayonara, uh, in this case, you're getting coins. And uh, theoretically, if I become more popular, just like with a baseball card, um, almost these were almost like digital baseball cards, right? And now we're talking about NFTs. But a Tatiana coin could be a collector's item, especially if I become more popular. So, yeah, I mean. No, but I, I, I guess like, the, was it also such that if I had bought some Tatiana coin, I get access to your music or something like that? Yeah. Like as well, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not for, oh, okay, interesting. Um, no, I asked because like, maybe there is something there, right? Because if there's all these middlemen and if all you're making is like seven grand off of a million views, like, uh yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I sometimes wonder, like, you know, maybe like, because it, it does seem like an untapped kind of resource, right? Like, and it seems like Bitcoin would be like a really good solution for, for helping a lot of these artists to almost like microfinance um, a song even, right? Like where you could even be like, I have a song. Here's like, like you said, your, your, your 10 second voice note of it. And if people are like, we want this played out, here's like, you know, a couple of Satoshi from like 10,000 people. And now you have enough money to, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going with this. Okay. Well, donation models, I think are definitely tricky though. Like people mm. are like, oh, people just give you money. No, they won't. Mm. Like when, when the economy collapses, people are going to be thinking about feeding their families. Mm. And that's why I'm always telling people like, you want to get into music and Bitcoin, just buy Bitcoin and you can, you know, you can make your music. And, and as time goes on, those platforms are going to be a lot more accessible, but um, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with what we built because it fills so many different important things like that go into an artist's career. Um, but, you know, while that platform is built, you know, it's not out in the market yet. And I'm not sure that there is anything in the market in, during this entire time that's been particularly compelling. Uh, people talk a lot about copyright, and that's certainly a major issue. And we solve that um, with our with the platform. But like most artists are never even going to record a song. So how are they going to have a copyright issue? And what are they going to fight over the copyright for like 10 plays? I mean, like no one cares. Uh, if you're going to get like seven grand that you have to split with your four band members for getting a million plays, like how is that a sustainable career? I don't know. It's depressing actually. It's, it's kept me up at night. Um, but you know, you got to push forward and, and try and find something else. And then sometimes I'll get people that are really complimentary and really sweet and, and those little nuggets, they, they do keep you going. But it is, it's sad that merit is not really rewarded necessarily in, in music. Like, does WAP need to be number one? Like, I don't know. I mean, I think that's terrible. Hey, I got like, two little daughters at home. That's the last thing I want to hear on the radio. Totally. Thank you very much. Well, that was, a, that was a really big issue for me because, you know, I, I've been talking about this a little bit lately because it really kind of, I, I came across some old notes uh, in my drawer and, and I was writing, you know, like, like school notes, like when you're passing notes in class to your friend. And I wrote to my friend and I said, oh, you know, I hate Kristen. She's just such a wannabe slut. And like, when I read it as an adult, I think back to myself, I'm like, that's kind of sad that like my insult is that she's a wannabe slut because the inverse would be the positive, which is she's a slut. Like, that's awesome. Like, you know what I mean? Where did I get that idea? And, and I would say that I got that idea from Madonna. And Madonna was the first super whore uh, musician, right? And, and don't get me wrong, I really loved her music. I felt like she had a lot more soul than uh, the, the subsequent pop charts. But 
that's not good for little girls. Like, what are you going to do when your kids go to school and they're exposed to that? You can only control them so much in the household and you can only protect them so much. And I get it. People have sex. People are going to be whatever. But I don't think that any anybody, men or women, are, are I'm sorry, boys or girls, because that's what we're talking about, kids. Like, I don't think that they're uh, at a better point in their life if they have sex too early or if they treat it too flippantly, like, there is a certain sacred nature to that. And that's been completely destroyed by pop artists and they make me really angry. And I feel like that really contributes to the detriment of society. I mean, look, there's a time and a place for a little booty shake. That's cool, I'm down. But when every single artist is in a competition to see who will show more skin and who will be more like a porn star, I mean, it's disgusting and it's um, horrible. It's just, it doesn't give you any kind of um, soul feed. And you have all these people that are on antidepressants around the country. And that's for a number of different reasons, right? But part of it is, is that I don't think that people are getting their souls fed, right? And they know that there's something wrong in society. And that music is reflecting that horrible part of society. Whereas before you would hear something like, especially again, in the 60s and 70s, there was all this incredible songwriting going on. And and those songs stand the test of time. You think WAP is going to be famous in 20 years? I sure as hell hope not. You know, so, you know, I don't think that anybody ever was made better for hearing hit me one more time. Like I, I would be hard pressed to find a single person on earth that was like, oh, I'm a better person from this. But there's a lot of, you know, actual songs that. But NSYNC, come on, and NSYNC, NSYNC. I hate them. I want them to die. Like, <laughs> and, and Justin Timberlake makes me so angry. Like You must have been a big Backstreet die. Boys fan. I don't know the difference between them. All I know <laughs> is that Justin Timberlake was one of them. And the other day I saw him singing with that guy. Oh gosh, I, I forget his name. Like Chris, Rob it's not Chris Robinson. He's the guy that sings that Tennessee whiskey song. You know, your love is smooth mm. like Tennessee whiskey. Mm. It's such a good song, right? And um, and that guy rips. He tears it up. And then you hear Justin Timberlake, and he's a soulful guy. He's super talented, but something about that polish, that little yeah, yeah, like. It's sickening. The other guy's like kind of chubby. He's got like a dirty beard. He looks like an animal. He's awesome. He makes you feel like, yeah, I want to drink whiskey with that guy. And then like Justin Timberlake's going to order a Zima. You know what I mean? Like I don't want to hang out with him. I know a lot of chicks think he's hot, but like I don't. And and uh, I don't want all my musicians to be hot. Look at Van Morrison. He's not hot. If we didn't have Van Morrison, we wouldn't have his collection of work that is still playing on the radio. You know, you go into a restaurant, they're still playing Van Morrison songs. And it's not because he was a stud, it was because he was talented and it, because it, he wrote something it, that made you feel. Have you ever seen a Bollywood movie? No, but I want to. No, so what they do in those is they have like a really good looking actor, actress, like playing the part of the movie, but then you know how inevitably they break out in the song at one point? It's usually like not their voice it's some guy that's not good looking who's got like a killer voice that just comes in and the guy just shakes his mouth and his booty as you would say and yeah that's the end of it hey tatiana so if people want the complete antithesis of what we're talking about like if they want to learn more about you listen to your music stay in touch with kind of what you're putting out there how do they how do they learn more about you like on twitter and all that oh well i'd love for people to check out my my various projects so um I have uh, TatianaMoroz.com as my hub. My, my Twitter is Queen Tatiana. I'm on all the social networks, unfortunately. I think that they eat my time. Um, but uh, I really like people to also check out the TatianaShow.com and ProofOfLoveCast.com, like podcast, but lovecast.com. Uh, and, you know, we have some cool interviews. Like we interviewed, I remember we interviewed Max Kaiser and Stacy because uh, I like to feature stories of love. And, you know, Max is, it's like an intense guy. He kind of intimidates me, scares me a little bit, even though he's perfectly nice, but like, I don't know. He's just like, uh, you know, like a little bit afraid of him. And, uh, but he was such a softie. He says, you know, toward the end of the interview, he says, the most important part of my day is, is making Stacy happy. And I was like, wow, you know, and it was so beautiful to hear that. And I don't think that a lot of people would necessarily know that he's that much of a softie. And I like the ability to get past the regular, uh, oh, look at my, show my stuff, like, oh, F the power, whatever, and get into um, things that are probably a little bit more constant than our daily online bickering. Uh, you I, know, I interviewed Max. He, he's, he's my most popular interview so far. Um, I've done 30 now, 25, 30, and 
He's my most fine. And my final question to him was, what's, the, what's, what's your secret with, with Stacy and uh, the relationship side of things? And yeah, I love Max. I think he's, I love his energy. What did he's he super say? intense. What did he say? Uh, he brings her No, well, it was that you have to watch it because it's quite a bit. He, we go, like, it's, it goes like really intense because he talks about religion and like how, you know, he's obviously religious about Bitcoin uh, more than anything, but he goes into a couple of different, couple of different strands i'm trying to remember i'm uh, you're putting me on the spot yeah i'm probably not gonna remember well but it, all i remember was, was touching and uh lots of views <laughs> but yeah. yeah but i'm sure i'm sure um you know what I, yeah like i said i really love what you're doing you've you, you've been so kind you've even come up to toronto at, to one of my events that i did and 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 you sang for all of us torontonians uh bitcoiners here and so really appreciate everything you do for, for everyone. And uh, yeah. And, and so, likewise, so thank you to putting together events. Like, I don't think that everybody necessarily appreciates how like significant, I think, especially in the early days of a contribution, the events aren't specifically yours. Like, I really felt like um, very well taken care of as a speaker, but also just the vibe there is really good. And I really miss traveling. I hope we all get to spend some time together soon. And maybe somehow you can do another event, but I don't want to hear about a virtual event. No more virtual. No, no more virtual events. Oh my gosh. Keep well, them away from me. I want to do a real event when this is all over, like a real massive big, like we'll take over an island or something. <laughs> well, with the exception, I, I have to be fair because there are some that I'm even participating in because I'm a little bit averse to like a Zoom thing or whatever. Um, but uh, Connie Gallippi from BitGive is doing an all charity crypto event. I'll be on that on one. November 18th. Oh, yeah. yeah so I, and I interviewed her. She, I just went live with her yesterday. I wow. did her Bitcoin That's story awesome. as well. So, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. She's one of my oldest friends in the space. And then um, mm -hmm. the other conference that I love to plug is a Latin American Bitcoin conference. Hey, Tatiana, That's the do, best. do you think Ross's mom would be down to share any of this? Or, is, I mean, I just wondered. Yeah. I'd love to be able to put a spotlight on, you know, kind of what's happening. I did meet her actually in, in Toronto. Uh, once like a couple yeah. years ago. And so, yeah, maybe we can talk about that offline, but Tatiana, great. Wait, did you actually leave the website and all that, the Twitter handle? I think you said you were going uh, to, right? Yep, tatianamrose.com. And if people need okay, crypto perfect. marketing and PR, they can go to cryptomediahub.com. Sweet. Okay, awesome. So with that, I'm going to bring it to a close. See you.